Hi friends, this is Jody, sharing a message with you from the comfort of my backyard. Pastor Rebecca asked me to share with you why I give to our church. And it's for me now more important than ever that I maintain the only thing beyond my family that is a constant, and that is our church fellowship and the place that has supported me through huge events in my life over the last decade or so. I know many of you have grown up in this church, but Jeff and I found this church after a long quest. And uh, even though he and I aren't married anymore, I made a decision to stay, which uh, Mangala has reinforced for me, even though he's Buddhist. And we actually spend our time um, on Sundays with you, either here in my home or in our church sanctuary. So today I wanted to just say that for me, when we get back to whatever we're going to call normal in the future, um, I'm going to want to see you first. I'm going to need that constant in my life more than ever because I think our reentry may be harder than our shelter in place. And I want our church to be there. I want our church to be strong. I want to um, reach out and hug our fellowship um, when we are able to do that. And it may take us a while. To get back there. So today I wanted to read you a very special passage from a book I'm reading called Ordinary Grace. It's a beautiful book. And in this book, uh, the father of the narrator and the main character is a pastor. And he has just found out that his daughter died. She either drowned or was killed and left in the river by their home. And he has uh, gone to church on Sunday to preach since he's a pastor, and this is what it says. When it came time for my father to deliver his sermon, I was concerned because I hadn't seen him prepare at all. He stepped up to the pulpit and for a moment simply looked out over the pews, every one of which was full, and then he began. It is an Easter, he said, but this week has caused me to think a lot about the Easter story. Not the glorious resurrection that we celebrate on Easter Sunday, but the darkness that came before. I know of no darker moment in the Bible than the moment Jesus, in his agony on the cross, cried out, Father, why have you forsaken me? Darker even than his death, not long after, because in death, Jesus at last gave himself over fully to the divine will of God. But in that moment of his bitter railing, he must have felt betrayed and completely abandoned by his father a father he'd always believed loved him and absolutely, sorry, always believed loved him deeply and absolutely. How terrible that must have been and how alone he must have felt. In dying, all was revealed to him, but at live, Jesus, like us, saw with mortal eyes, felt the pain of mortal flesh and knew the confusion of imperfect mortal understanding. I see with mortal eyes, my mortal heart this morning is breaking, and I do not understand. I confess that I have cried out to God, why have you forsaken me? Here my father paused, and I thought he could not continue, but after a long moment he seemed to gather himself and went on. When we feel abandoned, alone, and lost, what's left to us? What do I have? What do you have? What do any of us have left except the overpowering temptation to rail against God and to blame him for the dark night into which he has led us, to blame him for our misery, to blame him and cry out against him for not caring? What's left to us when that which we love most has been taken? I will tell you what's left, three profound blessings. In his first letter to the Corinthians, St. Paul tells us exactly what they are, faith, hope, and love. These gifts, which are the foundation of eternity, God has given to us, and he's given us complete control over them. Even in the darkest night, it's still within our power to hold to faith. We can still embrace hope, and although we may, and although we may ourselves feel unloved, we can still stand steadfast steadfast in our love for others and for God. All this is in our control. God gave us these gifts and he does not take them back. It is we who choose to discard them. 
In your dark night, I urge you to hold to your faith, to embrace hope, and to bear your love before you like a burning candle. For I promise that it will light your way. And whether you believe in miracles or not, I can guarantee you that you will experience one. It may not be the miracle you've prayed for. God probably won't undo what's been done. The miracle is this, that you will rise in the morning and be able to see again the startling beauty of the day. Jesus suffered the dark night and death, and on the third day he rose again through the grace of his loving Father. For each of us, the sun sets and the sun also rises, and through the grace of our Lord, we can endure our own dark night and rise to the dawning of a new day and rejoice. I invite you, my brothers and sisters, to rejoice with me in the divine grace of the Lord and in the beauty of this morning, which he has given us. My father's eyes swept over the congregants who filled the pews, silent as dandelions with upturned faces. He smiled and said, Amen. And after a moment, Gus beside me called out, Amen, which was a most unmethodist thing to do. And then I heard another voice echo, Amen. And I turned and saw that it was Travis Clement who had spoken and I watched as his wife laid her hand lovingly on his arm. I left the church that morning feeling as I do this day that I exper had experienced a miracle, the one promised by my father who had spoken a truth profound and simple. I walked across the street to our house where my mother sat with Emile Brandt in the living room with the curtains drawn against the morning light. And I went upstairs to my bedroom where Jake lay on his mattress still in his pajamas. So I will see you all on the other side of this shelter in place at our church. God bless.